So thank you everyone for joining me for tonight's One Night Stand presentation. Uh, this is a series of presentations that we do at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, where we focus on one work of art and one artist for one night. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, Julia Jessen. And tonight we're going to be speaking about Kristen Capp's Carol with Cabbages, Lamona Colony, Washington, 1994. This work is currently featured right now in the exhibition Ravenous Food in Art, which includes a wide variety of works that include food and delves into the many meanings that can be encompassed by these foods. This image is part of a series that Cap created on the Hutterite community in Washington state. And we'll return to the series and the community in just a moment. But first I wanna talk a bit about Kristen Cap's background. Cap was born in 1964. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where she majored in Russian and French language and literature. It was during this time that she first discovered a passion for photography somewhat accidentally. And she ended up returning back home to Seattle and beginning a journey of learning about photography, teaching herself darkroom practice, uh, before eventually moving to New York. New York City in 1994, which is the same year that she would start the series that we're focusing on today. During her 16 years in New York, she would apprentice with the surrealist photographer Ralph Gibson, and you're seeing a couple of his images on the screen. And she would also assist several other fine art photographers uh, while continuing her exploration of darkroom techniques and furthering her own photography practice. So this series comes from early on during this period of her life uh, when she would begin working on these, these images. They were shot using a medium format Rolleiflex camera. And this work, Carol with Cabbages, depicts a young Hutterite woman balancing two cabbages in her elevated hands as she steps through a field with a concerned expression on her face. The image highlights both the traditional form of clothing worn by the Hutterites and the harvesting that the community practices. This and many of the other photographs in the series show the importance of food for the Hutterite community through the depiction of these agricultural routines and these cycles of life that are continuing throughout the year. Cap first heard about the Hutterite community while she was living in Soap Lake in Eastern Washington state. She had relocated to this region to photograph for six months, and she was taking images sort of similar to what you're seeing on the screen right now. Several months in, she learned of the Hutterite colonies in the area, and this would turn into a multi-year photographic exploration where she would eventually spend nearly four years photographing these different colonies. The Hutterites are an Anabaptist people, similar to the Amish and the Mennonites, with their origins being rooted in the 16th century Protestant Reformation. But they broke with the majority in their objection to infant baptisms. Their desire to form their own sort of religious society um, where they didn't do those infant baptisms undermined the state church and ended up posing a threat to the state church. And so during this period and in periods throughout their existence, they've been persecuted uh, because of this, because of the way that they live their life and the faith that they follow. And so they traveled throughout Europe um, as this persecution kind of followed them from place to place. Eventually they would emigrate from Russia in 1879. And initially they settled in South Dakota. At the time that Kristen Kapp was taking these photographs, there was about 40,000 Hutterite people living in 400 colonies in North America. Uh, in these Hutterite colonies, they speak Hutterite German, but they also learn English so that, they can, so that they can communicate with the outside world, and High German, which is the language of their old sermons and writings. And so that's a language that's very important to them so that they're able to kind of fully engage with those old sermons and writings in the way that was originally intended. The Hutterites have sort of a rational approach to faith. It's based on what they consider to be the facts of their scripture. 
rather than being based on an emotional experience of faith or of a higher power. They are an insular communal people. They have no personal property and the colony provides for all material needs. For the most part, the colonies are self-sufficient farm operations. When Kristen Cap initially heard about this group, um, in these different colonies with the Hutterites living in them. She ended up introducing herself to the Walter family in Lamona um, in Washington in 1994. And she was invited in for a cup of coffee and became friends with the family. And you're seeing a couple of those family members here, Janet and Carol Walter. And Carol and Janet both will recur in these images, but particularly Carol. And Carol is the Carol that we saw in Carol with Cabbages at the very beginning as well. When Kristen first began speaking with them and experiencing their way of life, she became fascinated by their preservation of this lifestyle, uh, the preservation of their language, their style of dress, their religious beliefs, and their strong connection to the earth cycles and to the land. And that's something that she really wanted to capture. And we see that represented through a lot of these different harvest images in particular, but also cycles of life um, throughout these photographs as well. Although they are an insular community, they've also adapted to modern technology when necessary. And they remain interested and curious about life on the outside. And that's also visible through these photographs. Uh, we see that happening. According to their interpretation of the Bible, this doesn't conflict with the obligation to lead a spiritual life, and so they're able to do this and incorporate these different forms of technology. Uh, one kind of unexpected consequence, perhaps, is that it is more difficult to maintain a mental seclusion from the outside world as more of these technologies come in. Uh, for example, automobiles, like what you see uh, in the image uh, on your screen, uh, automobiles also brought radios with them too. And so they were able to get more of this outside influence, hear more of what's happening in the outside world. And so some of those barriers are somewhat sort of breaking down. On the farms, they use combines. Uh, their carpentry shops employ computer-aided design. And nearly every home has an electric sewing machine as well. And there's Janet Walter with her electric sewing machine. Despite the incursion of these technological advancements, uh, one of the colony leaders has said there, there isn't anything to fear from, from this contact. Uh, he said there's no danger whatsoever in having contact with the outside world as long as we remain true to our own principles. But if we stray from our path, contact of any kind will become dangerous. The Walter family introduced Kristen to other people in their colony and other colonies in the region. There are five Hutterite farming colonies in eastern Washington state, and she photographed them along the way. And with the project culminating eventually with Cap attending the wedding at Riverbend Colony in Saskatchewan, Canada of her friend Carol from the Lamona Colony. The images that we see, not only of Carol and the Walter family, but also of all of these different people that she met and photographed, feel very intimate. Uh, we feel kind of close in. We've been given this very close access to her subjects. But at the same time, there is sort of a separation there. The viewer can still feel like an outsider peering in. And we're not necessarily meant to feel comfortable as we're looking at these photographs. One kind of common misconception um, that people think with the Hutterites and with other Anabaptist people is that they either don't like or forbid photography. But the Hutterite rule against photography is not as strict as what might be supposed. It's definitely true that some of the older residents didn't want their photographs taken, but others actually had simple cameras of their own that they used to record weddings and intercolony gatherings. When we look at these images, most of the Hutterites don't make eye contact with the lens. They look away, they gaze down, or they focus on the person holding the camera, which we saw in the previous image as well with Carol Walter looking up at the photographer. 
So sometimes this, this kind of avoidance of the lens can make the images feel relatively candid um, and sort of spontaneous, like these are moments that are just kind of naturally happening that we're here for. Uh, depending on the expression that the subject has, it can also make them seem comfortable in their setting as well. Occasionally, there will be a shadow that's in the image or even eye contact, uh, either with the photographer, some of what we've seen, or with the camera that reminds the viewer of Cap's presence there in the space as the photographer. And it sort of reminds us, gives us a little bit of a jolt back to tell us that although she has been given this access and they feel very intimate and immediate in their connection, at the same time, she's showing us sort of a curated vision, whatever she has been given access to, whatever she has been allowed to see. And so although it feels very intimate and close, there is still that reminder that it's only what she's been able to see and record that's being represented here. Um, kind of continuing with the Hutterite's own relationship with photography. In this image, Darius Walter holds a photograph of himself made 25 years before. And he seems very sort of proud and pleased with this image and enjoys sharing it with others and enjoyed sharing it with the photographer as she was taking images of him as well. And he would use it to reflect back on an earlier time. And so in that way, we can think too about how photographs allow us to capture memories, allow us to reflect back, allow us to construct our own visions of what our memories are and be able to share them with others, um, even in this Hutterite community where there is still someone who is doing that and using a photograph to be able to share these stories of himself um, for his own self and for others as well. Cap spent a lot of time with the women of the community, which seems kind of obvious um, that she would have greater access to them, that it would be more natural for her to spend time with them um, and sort of make more sense in that way. And that access and greater intimacy, we feel that coming through in the photographs. At the same time, Cap also has to negotiate her own feelings too. As a woman of the 1990s, um, looking at the women in this community, uh, she, of course, found the restrictions on them in the community and the restrictions on sort of the level in society that they're able to reach and their sort of advancement. Um, of course, she found those things problematic, and it was something for her to sort of negotiate. And what we see in the images is not necessarily an acceptance of their place in society, but rather an acceptance of perhaps their own acceptance, or at least the attempt to understand their acceptance of their place in society and their choice to live this lifestyle. Um, there's sort of a respect that exists there and we feel that coming through. And perhaps that is a reason that it gives greater access and perhaps why we were able to step in closer and gain this greater intimacy with these people because of the respect that the photographer afforded them in their choices of their way of life. These photographs, although they do include sort of a curated or just what was allowed to be seen vision of the Hutterite community, they also can contradict our impression of what a society like this would look like. Um, we would think of this as being very kind of structured and rigid and rule following. And they reveal something more of the reality of the group, something that feels a bit more ambiguous and less perfect than we would originally think. And like I said, there was sort of a mutual admiration at play, a mutual respect at play that was happening. These images were published in a book. And one of the essays in the book was written by Rod Slemons, who was a previous curator of photography at the Seattle Art Museum. And he makes a connection between Cap's work and that of other social realist photographers who photograph different communities, including W. Eugene Smith, Dorothea Lange, and Mary Ellen Mark. And whenever we think about this type of photography of documenting communities that are different from one's own, we also get into the murky territory of the ethics of that um, and kind of start to ask some of these questions about what is ethical in this practice. 
Is it right to intrude or invade into someone's way of life? And those that create this type of photography often end up relying on the justification that the invasion is worth it for the sake of communicating a truth or giving voice to something or someone, um, or perhaps highlighting an injustice that that's taking place and warrants that sort of invasion into someone's life or into a community's life. And although CAP's work exists somewhere within this legacy of social documentary photography, it also is different from it. She's not doing the same thing that some of these photographers are where she's going into a community with the desire to gain knowledge and create this kind of fact-based documentary evidence of a community that she can share with others. Um, instead, she's very much interested in their cycle of life and portraying that through her images rather than this kind of factual interpretation. Dorothea Lang, created her own photographs of the Hutterites as well um, in the early 1940s. And these are interesting because they reveal more of the shyness of being photographed that the Hutterites had, and also Lang's own respect for this as well. So we see more images of turned backs in Lang's versions. We see more objects that they surrounded themselves with um, or sort of wider views where we're farther away from people and seeing kind of a wider view of the community. The contrast between the two, between Lang and Cap's images, seems to indicate that Cap was granted a greater closeness perhaps than Lang was, or that times had changed even for the Hutterite, and perhaps there was less discomfort at a photographer in their midst um, in the 1990s than there was in the 1940s. And like I said, in contrast to Lang, Cap is not gathering facts or compiling a social document, putting together an anthropological project on the community. Rather, she's joining with the community in a cycle of their life for this brief amount of time. Um, so inserting herself into a cycle of the seasons, a cycle of their yearly life. I mentioned that these photographs were published in a book how to write A World of Grace. And you see that the photograph that we've been focusing on is the cover image. Uh, this book was a great reference and resource uh, for this presentation. And if you're interested in more information, I would encourage you to check it out. There are great, very large uh, photographs um, for this entire series and some really good essays too about the Hutterites and about interpretations of Cap's work as well. And the book for Cap is something that's very important in her work. During her time in New York, she became really interested in the photo book as a way to present and contextualize her work. The book is actually so important to Cap that she has said that until a body of work inhabits the book form, her work feels unfinished and unresolved. She does also enjoy the ephemeral quality of her work being exhibited in sort of that temporary display of her pieces, um, but it's the completeness that she finds from the book project um, that she enjoys. And she's worked on multiple long-term projects which also received the book treatment. So another of these is Americana from 2000. These photos were captured while she was traversing the United States throughout the 1990s, and they illuminate different pockets of the country, which can feel very separate from each other, but also have some overriding similarities. In the book and through these photographs, Cap has created sort of her own version of America, this narrative through her photographs of a mythological West um, and how she's constructed that in this series of images that she put together in the book titled Americana. Another of these book projects is Brazil from 2016. And this was something that she worked on for about eight years, photographing in Brazil, again with her Rolleiflex medium format camera. And her interest was initially captured by Brazil because uh, she has a real interest in rural communities and the African diaspora, and that's what led her there initially. She was then able to immerse herself in the local culture through an artist residency in 2003, 
And the images that she was able to capture show a relationship between the natural landscape, the shape of the natural landscape, as well as the constructed forms of the city. She also had a really strong interest in the architecture of these larger cities in Brazil as well. And so through these images, she, she immerses the viewer in the culture of the world's largest African diaspora. Um, together, they create this complex contemporary portrait of Brazil that is both urban and rural in its depiction. And this was a project that she crowdfunded through Kickstarter to be able to publish the book. Um, one of the reasons that she did this was just the ability to be able to publish it. But another reason was it did give her greater creative control. And that was something that she wanted to be able to have a say in all of these elements of the book production. And so by crowdfunding it through Kickstarter, that enabled her to be able to do that. In 2011, she received a Fulbright Fellowship to travel to Namibia, where she would conduct photographic research on rural Namibian communities and lecture at the University of Namibia. She also led photography workshops as seen in these photos from the US Embassy in Namibia. And after that Fulbright Fellowship, she ended up staying permanently in Namibia. And so that's where she lives today. And now she directs the new media design program at the College of the Arts in Namibia. And so some of her more recent work in Namibia explores how collective memory is created and defined by both personal recollections, personal memories, but also how it's created within communities and for individuals as well. And I would say that's something that comes across in some of her previous projects too, that influence of collective memory and the creation of that in her work. Uh, the two images that you see on the screen come from her series Latitudes, which she started working on in 2011 actually, and has continued working on for many years. And these images are sort of fragments of emotion, fragments of personal experience. They feel very interior and sort of illuminate these personal narratives. Each image asks questions of both the photographer and the viewer, and the answers that are given are different as time passes and as meaning evolves. So every time these answers become different to the questions that are asked. While in Namibia, she also began working in color. Uh, she's talked about this as being a very different thought process than working in black and white. But at the same time, it also felt like a very natural extension of her photographic practice. Um, something about it was kind of intuitive to her, and it also suited her chosen subject of Namibia while she was in, while she was there. Um, and shooting in color felt like this very natural extension, a natural way for her work to move. Uh, the photos that you see on your on your screen are from a series called Absence and Evidence. They're very constrained and simple, but with these very bright pops of color. And she's talked about how after her Hutterite work. People thought of her as a portrait photographer, but she herself has always felt that she's just as interested in spaces and in the effect of human presence within a space as with the actual human presence in a human portrait. And so these two images fall into that investigation, the investigation of human presence without the human figure is definitely visible here. Another couple of examples here, one with one of these human figure portraits um, that she's so good at, and also another of these examples of the evidence of a human presence without the human figure being visible um, within the photograph. She remains very interested in community-based multidisciplinary projects where she's able to engage her students that she works with um, at the university. Um, and she does this through combining text and image and video to reflect on Namibia's colonial past. In her teaching practice, she sees her students dealing with issues of personal identity, social justice, uh, different types of documentary subject matter and gender equality. 
And these are all things that she also wants to foster in her students and continue to encourage them to pursue as well. Finally, I wanted to return back to our image from earlier in her career, where she had first started exploring these deep dives into a space or a culture or a community. And this would be an interest that would end up taking her all over the world, as we've seen, and resulted in many different projects where she's exploring these different peoples, different spaces, and then sharing them with the public, um, often through her book projects, but also through different exhibitions and through different displays that she's been able to do throughout her career. So I'm going to finish up there, but I hope this has been interesting and that you've learned something new throughout this presentation. Um, I want to leave a little time here for questions. And so are there any questions that I can attempt to answer for you in the next couple minutes? All right, no problem. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight for this one night stand presentation. And um, I hope you'll come back again for another one night stand presentation or for any of our other great Zoom content or in-person content. Keep an eye out on our social media and also our events calendar on our website. And I hope to see you again soon. So thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy your evening.